All right, welcome to Part B, Lecture 18, History of Money. All right, so Napoleon affects his coup d'etat on the 9th of November, 1799. By this point, he was already a very well-known general. Napoleon will bring the order, bring the stability that France needs, that France is thirsting after, really following 10 years of total chaos. And Napoleon brings that order. Financially, he brings order too. Monetarily, he brings order. No more fiat currency under Napoleon. Napoleon reestablishes the gold standard, a metallic standard in France. And Napoleon actually, in his seizure of power, is helped, is aided, is supported by several powerful French financiers. Um, you remember, French financiers were integral in, in persuading Louis to attempt tax reform in the 1780s. And so, in a way, French financiers were integral to, to the early stages of the French Revolution. In a similar way, uh, French financier, financiers are integral to the rise of Napoleon at the end of 1799. And Napoleon returns a favor the f a few months later by establishing the Bank of France, which will now be occupied and run and administered, administered by many of these same financiers. In 1800, France receives its first ever fully incorporated institutionalized bank, the Bank of France. Bank of France operates on a fractional reserve basis and issued banknotes. This is a, a bit later in 1863, a thousand francs. And these banknotes were redeemable in gold, in gold or, or silver for smaller change. Now you may ask, you know, how is it that Napoleon was just able to sort of snap his fingers and return France to a gold standard? Well, Napoleon, as I noted, was a, a, a conqueror, a, a very successful general, one of the most successful generals in world history. Of course, he had a few major, uh, major losses at the end. But nevertheless, Napoleon was a brilliant general. And whichever area he conquered or defeated... Napoleon would plunder and would, would was very uh, mindful, careful of, of seizing from that area gold, silver, or any other valuable items. And much of this, the, these, uh, uh, the plunder from wartime expeditions returned to France and, and helped to reestablish a sounder currency. And with the ejection of the bad fiat paper currency, according to Gresham's Law, as long as there's bad money right in circulation as long as there, there's a lot of fiat currency in circulation good money coin silver and gold coin won't enter circulation with the ejection of the bad paper currency you, so, you see a sort of uh, uh, a return of coin that previously was hoarded maybe in chess and no, they return to circulation you notice on this uh coin here this is napoleon when he was um, first consul first consul which was a or an executive term harking back to the Roman Republic. Well, in 1804, Napoleon upgrades his title to that of emperor and declares in 1804 the dawn of the French Empire. And so the coinage reflected that. Napoleon, emperor. And you'll see on Napoleon the laurel, reminding any of users of that currency of Caesar, a powerful general who's become emperor. There were a lot of parallels between Napoleon and Caesar. Of course, he did not uh, dress like this on any other occasion. Uh, this was Napoleon's dress. But now we have the French Empire and the beginning of um, over a decade of warfare in Europe on a scale never before seen. Just total war in continental Europe. As Napoleon for a while, conquers all, much of the continent of Europe. Uh, here in the map, areas that Napoleon directly controlled are in the dark blue, and the lighter blue are areas that were controlled by proxy through either relatives or 
other delegated powers, and then in green, more tenuously controlled. But you look at that. I mean, that's I mean, it looks almost like a map of the European Union. I mean, it's a that's a big chunk of Europe controlled by Napoleon. Two powers that are uh, that remain: Britain. Of course, you have the Ottoman Empire over here, but the Ottomans aren't doing much at this point. The Ottomans are in a period of stagnation, and, and also the Ottomans are, are engaged in a lot of wars with Russia, but not to get distracted. Britain and Russia are the two main powers now. And Britain is a formidable foe. These are extremely expensive military campaigns. Well, Napoleon, through um, some bad decision making, um, namely invading Russia in winter, retreats in 1811 uh, into 1812. Uh, in 1812, retreats from Russia, suffers a major battle, a uh, major loss in Germany, and eventually is exiled at Elba an island off the coast of Italy. You know the story. Um, Napoleon escaped exile, um, returned to France, riled up the army, and fought a final battle at Waterloo, which is in Belgium, in June of 1815. Loses that battle, of course, and then is exiled to an island uh, off the coast of South America. After Napoleon's defeat, a new period of European history, about a century long period, 1815 and 1914, that historians are called the Concert of Europe. And, and it's called the Concert of Europe because you had different European powers working in concert to preserve a balance of power, preserve um, this age of conservatism in which the more radical liberal tendencies of the American Revolution and of the French Revolution are de-emphasized. And in its place, stability, order, hierarchy, um, those things are placed at the top. And preserving the just current order of things. Now you do have liberalism in 19th century Europe. It's more of the classical variety. Again, the more the radical elements that you see in France during the revolution are, are suppressed. And this balance of power is constructed between all these competing powers in which you really don't have just one single power controlling the continent, but rather a concert of powers. Now the rise of Germany in 1870 will challenge that concert and in many ways undermine it um, nevertheless we have this now the british were the most dominant power in the 19th century 19th century affairs but they didn't have uh they didn't in any sense dominate the continent of europe they were more of a global empire but the british were of these powers the most powerful the most wealthy this was the uh, co um, Congress of Vienna in 1815, which arranged for the post-Napoleonic War settlement. Monetarily, this is the age of the gold standard. Now, we talked about bimetallism, and bimetallism was the, the basic rule in, in Europe, really up through, the 19th, up through the early 19th century. But by the mid-19th century, most of Europe, and definitely by the late 19th century, most of Europe has abandoned silver, except for small change. Silver was still used for small change, like you know our equivalent of if you need a few bucks to buy a cup of coffee, right? But other than that, the gold standard is embraced. Gold coins now now rule the European economy in in concert with central banking. So you have central banking, and central banking in nineteenth century Europe is in nineteenth century Europe is established all over the continent in these different countries. And uh, central banks would issue issue banknotes redeemable in gold. Here we have a coin of Queen Victoria, uh, actually right when she became queen in eighteen thirty eight. Gold coin of 
the Austrian Emperor Francis, Franz Joseph. Here's a gold coin of the French Emperor in the 1850s, Napoleon III, who was a nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte. Here's a later gold coin of an older Queen Victoria of England. We already noted the Bank of France. There's a 20 franc note. Here, uh, when it was still the French Empire, Napoleon III. Napoleon III was overthrown in 1871 after the Franco-Prussian War. And a republic of, in France was declared. And this was the new, the new Republican coinage in France, 1874. Gold coinage. When Germany unites into a single country in 1870, 1871, it's followed by the establishment of a central bank in Germany, the Reichsbank. And here too, banknotes issued by this central bank backed by gold coin. There's Wilhelm II, the Kaiser of Germany. Some more banknotes redeemable in gold. Finance centralizes and, and, and deposits concentrate in, in a few large institutions. In England, you may recall when we talked about the Bank of England, I, I made note, I said, hey, look, you know, only the Bank of England could issue banknotes in London, but you had banks outside of London who issued their own banknotes. And that was true up through 1844. 1844, Parliament passes an act. Only the Bank of England can issue banknotes in the United Kingdom. France does something similar. In France, when the Bank of France is first founded, other banks outside of Paris, the Bank of France had a monopoly of note issue in Paris, but outside Paris, other banks could issue banknotes. But in 1848, the French government um, uh, grants the Bank of France a monopoly of no issue over all of France. Look at these. Look at these numbers. So country banks were banks outside of London, and and again, you'll remember many of them issued their own banknotes. After 1844, no more, no more of that. Only Bank of England. Then you look at the number. In 1809, there were 755 country banks in Britain. By the eve of World War I, there were only 17. Now, as we'll see when we get to the United States in the 19th century, the United States is 180 degrees different. The number of banks in the United States grows substantially during this same 100-year period. And the U.S. rejects central banking. But we'll get to that later. But it's quite the opposite of what happens in Europe. Um, wait on that. We'll get we'll get to all that later. But Britain, just the Bank of England. There's a Bank of England note from 1916, backed by gold coin. Now, actually, this note in 1916 wasn't backed by gold coin because it was in the middle of World War One, and the Bank of England suspended specie payments. But anyway, I digress. Most of the time before the uh, war. These notes were redeemable in gold coin. Then there's the interior of the Bank of England. A lot of wealth. And if there was a one um, family that we could point to as symbolic and as representative of this centralization of finance, the power of finance in 19th century Europe, that would, of course, be the Rothschild family. And so for part C of Lecture 18, we'll take a look at the House of Rothschild. See you there.